Well, happy Easter, Vintage Church. How y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? Come on. Man, it's so good to see you. Before we go any further, I know we have lots of guests. Vintage Church, can we give it up one more time for all of our guests? Come on. Super glad that you're here. My name's Stephen, and I am the pastor um, at this particular location. I'm super excited that you spent part of your Easter weekend with us. You know, this is the, the, one of the few times that our busy, neurotic world slows down. Just to pause. And, and, and here's what I want to do. I, I know you probably have all kinds of things you're thinking about right now. Like, I mean, it's 8.30, but if you're a guy in here, you're already hungry. Come on. You're already thinking about food. You're maybe thinking about preparing the house for a family lunch or going out with your family or connecting with your friends. Here's what I want you to do for the next few moments. I want you to just consider this place just a a sacred place for just a moment. The truth is it's a metal building, and before it was a church, it was a club. Come on. (laughs) But today as we're gathered in it, let's just make it a sacred place. It's sacred because it's a place where God's people meet. You know, the word sacred means to be set apart. There's so much mixture in our culture. There's so much blurring of lines that nothing seems sacred and set apart. And I think one of the greatest blessings of Easter as we turn towards this moment in human history is the sacredness of a man, 100% man, 100% God, who not only died on the cross for our sins, but defeated death, left it in its grave. And for just the next few moments... Even if you're in here and you're saying, I don't know if I believe all that. Okay, just for the next few moments, let's just make this place set apart as we lean into the Easter story. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6. The first Easter morning. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, like 8.30, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood before them out of nowhere in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. The angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. I'm going to pause here for just a moment. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? I don't know that there's another phrase in all of the Bible that can sum up the condition of our world right now. Isn't that true? We're looking for life, for meaning, for purpose in every place that it isn't. You know, I remind our church this constantly when they have their smartphones. Hey, you do know that when they say smartphone, they're not talking about you, they're talking about the phone. Come on, right? We have all of this technology, all of this material wealth, unlike any other time in human history, and yet we're more depressed, more anxious, more sad. And listen, if you're in here and you're far from God and you're a skeptic, how's your world going for you? You know, a lot of times as modern people, we snub our nose up at those ancient things. In our busyness, we don't pause to ask the important questions. I think one of the reasons... Why even people who are far from God, by the way, the Bible says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are destined for destruction, but it's salvation for those of us who believe. And that is the story, the ancient wisdom of life. And as I reflect on the gospel, I I don't know that it's just because a man defeated the grave. I think sometimes we pause because it's one of the few times outside of funerals that we actually look at death. We're so busy, and what happens is we end up getting, you guys do know we're all getting there. We're all going to go there once. Those who are found in Christ, there's a life, there's a hope. This world, the Bible says, is not all that there is, you postmodern skeptic know-it-all. There's great pride in our modern world against the timeless, tested questions that people used to ask in the West. Big questions. Not where I'm going to lunch after Easter. Or not, honey, did you pick up this or that? But what do I want others to say about me when, not if, I die? Questions like, what happens after that? I think a lot of people turn towards Easter 
And they get way more than they bargained for. That's my prayer for you. I want to hone in for the next few moments four wins of the resurrection. And I, I want to I focus on this whole series has been about winning. Did you know God designed you to win? Every part of your life that's broken and not working right now, that's not because God's a loser. That's because you're the loser. That's what Easter reminds us. We didn't defeat the grave on our own. We can't get there on our own. There's a hum- humility that comes with realizing that we are finite and that God is infinite. And you know, you were created by God to win. There's only one other place I have ever been that, felt, that feels like a worship service. And it's an arena. It's a stadium. And it's a court. We love it. We love watching people stretch Like, we love the underdog. We love when the odds are stacked against someone. For some reason, people still cheer and support the Dallas Cowboys. I don't understand it. Except that I understand the desire to win. I know what it feels like to be a loser, just like the Dallas Cowboys are most of the time. We love to put the ball in the hoop. We do. We love to kick the field goal. We love to see that incredible feat of physical strength. God put that there. The Bible says eternity is written on the human heart. I don't care how modernized our world gets. I don't care how many electric cars we have and metaverses this and that there are. Nothing is going to replace the moral reality of our world. There's what is this table And there's what you ought to do about it. Those are two totally different things. Did you know science does not answer the latter? Only the truths of Scripture can answer the latter. And the resurrection's all about winning. Jesus died on a cross for you so that you could win because we had a long history of losing. Four wins of the resurrection. First, we see that Jesus wins over sickness. We see sickness and disease all over our world. I was reading recently that the lifespan for one of the first times in the last 50 years is actually declining. It used to be 76 years for men. It's 68 now. Did you know that? Wow, so much technological advance. That's everywhere. Jesus, in his very first sermon in the book of Luke chapter 4, He stands up and he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, a prophecy about himself. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal, and he would heal a lot. Later in Luke 4, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. He heals the paralytic in Luke 5. He heals a man of leprosy a deformed, with a deformed hand in Luke 6. He heals a blind man named Bartimaeus in Luke 18. The writers of the Gospels would say that if they wrote down every single thing Jesus did in his healing ministry, there wouldn't be enough books to contain it. The stories were just too vast. As you know, there's a few miracles that were saved just for Jesus so that his people would know that he was the Messiah. And you know, that's why even today we believe for healing. That's why we open up our altars in worship. Because when Christ died on the cross and he defeated the grave, he won over sickness. The truth is, all of us one day will die. But those in Christ have a hope. You may not get your healing this side of heaven. But make no mistake, when Jesus said, it is finished, Your healing was assured. It was done in that moment. Isaiah 61, 2, he's quoting from Isaiah. Let's go to that verse. Comfort all who mourn. Provide for those who mourn in Zion to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. All of us have been touched by sickness in some way. The promise of the resurrection is that Jesus wins over sickness. But did you know, as difficult as the results of sin and death are in our world, the greatest foe, right, is sin. Did you know Jesus wins over sin? I want to spend some time talking about this. 
today because I think sometimes in our busyness, um, we don't stop to ask questions that make us honest. And as a world, you look out and you can see a whole lot of people who are running so fast, so hard. They believe so much in what they're doing and they're right to this and they're right to that that they haven't asked the questions that bring humility. They haven't looked in the mirror at the person that they really are. That's one of the reasons why there's such a great attack against the Bible. James says the Bible's like this mirror. We can call it this way. It's like this judge that's constantly reminding us we're not who we could be. The Bible says it's like a mirror, reflects back to us. Wise is the person who looks at that mirror and doesn't forget what they look like. In other words, they don't forget what they look like. They don't become dishonest. They don't call truth a lie or a lie a truth. Jesus wins over sin. Some of you, you walked in here and you absolutely are fully aware of your sin. Maybe you're in here and you're far from God and that's what brings you here. You're just like, you've tried everything else. It's just maybe I'll give this Jesus thing a try. It seems like Easter is a big deal. Everyone's getting dressed up. By the way, you look nice. Some of you in here though, you don't. You don't have a humility that opens up your heart to the bigger questions of life. Others of you, you're thinking, man, my life's not so bad. I got a great job, nice car. I plug it in instead of put gas in it. I feel more virtuous than everyone else. I have a beautiful house, wonderful spouse, or at least when she listens to me. I'm doing just fine, Pastor. I don't, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean, sin? I'm, I'm doing good. The Bible calls that sin pride. I believe the greatest sin of the modern world is pride. You look around our world, the darkness, the Bible says that God himself resists proud people, but that he gives grace to the humble. One of the reasons we see what's going on in our world is it's just eaten through with pride, the pride of the modern world, the pride in the garden that says, I will be God. Not like God, God, that was a lie. Some of you are thinking, no, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? What do you mean? I'm not a sinner. Okay, the Bible is so good at this. There was the same problem then. You know, for all of our technology and materialism, man, we struggle with the same things. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Galatians, who had a lot of people in it that came to Easter. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about everything. Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh are obvious. There's some obvious ones, sexual morality, that's pretty obvious. Moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry. That includes idol idolizing your children, your job, your spouse, your status. What about sorcery? Any, any witches in here? Warlocks? <laughs> what about hatred? Strife? Any drama queens or kings in here? Jealousy? Ooh, outbursts of anger. Guys, any? Ever? Selfish ambitions? Have you ever done anything? That wasn't really about anyone else but you? You ever virtue signal online with no intent to actually make a difference? You ever take the admiration from someone for nothing? Factions, dissensions, envy, drunkenness. Ever drink too much? Carousing. I love this. But for those of you who still aren't convinced, he says, or anything similar... Is there anything in the ballpark that you've ever done that fits into any of those categories? Those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It isn't sickness that separates us from God. The Bible teaches us it's sin that separates us from God. Sinful pride is what's wrong with the world. Good news. There's good news. There's good news. From the place of honesty, you can chart a path in Christ. The cross and the resurrection, it's a path that was not open to us before. You know, have you ever discovered that shortcut? You know, Waco construction? You want to get by it? Nothing, 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 nothing. Then a pass opens up. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him, Jesus, as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him, Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who isn't just but who's put their faith in him. 
He goes on to say in Romans 6, 23 and 8, 1 and 2, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We celebrate the victory over sin. But did you know Jesus also wins over Satan? There's this ancient enemy. He has a name and he's out to destroy you. We do ourselves a disservice when we think that all we see is all that there is. Satan is also a problem. The great C.S. Lewis in his book, Screw Tape Letters, I would encourage every believer to read it, says this about Satan or the devils. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. The Bible says this about overcoming Satan. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power of the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ has now come, because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimonies, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Something happened through the cross, through the resurrection. The Bible says on the cross, you were completely forgiven. When Jesus says, it is finished, there wasn't a dot, dot, dot or a comma. All of your sins, past, present, and future, were nailed to that cross. This idea is called justification. What it means is the price for our sin had a cost, and that cost had to be exacted. It was exacted exacted on Christ. We are justified when we put our life in his hand. The Bible says that when Jesus ascended into heaven after the resurrection, 50 days after the resurrection, the Bible says he sent his Holy Spirit to start this process in us called sanctification. That sounds really religious, but what it means is we, we begin to conform our life to who he is. Now we have the power of his presence, the very power and presence of Christ operating in us to become like him. Let me say it this way. Before Christ, you're a bad person who occasionally does good. And until you get that figured out, you'll never be able to know Christ. But did you know after Christ, the Bible says, you are completely redeemed. You now become a good person who occasionally does bad. Any Christians in here fit that description? Come on. I saw y'all fighting on the way to church. Come on. But then one day the Bible talks about glorification. This is a promise of the resurrection. That we're all appointed once to die physically. But the hope of Easter, the hope of Christ, his ultimate victory is that one day we will be glorified with him. He said, I went first. I love that about God. There's no other faith. There's no other belief system that says, you know what? Let me show you personally. What do we call him at Easter? Jesus is... Emmanuel, God with us. I don't know if you've thought about this, but the crucifixion literally was humanity killing God. But he didn't stay that way. And this is the ultimate victory I want to talk about as we close. And this is really what I want you to think about this Easter. If you're in here and you're far, with, far from God, I really want you to think about it. Because there is a hole in your heart that no material thing will ever be able to fill. And I can save you a lot of time and heartache by pointing you to Christ. I believe you're here for a reason and a purpose. Jesus wins over death. I could say a lot of things about this, but I think the resurrection says it all. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Those dying bodies cannot inherit that which will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret we will not all die, but we will all be transformed. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus. Consider these words. Death is swallowed up in victory. Man, that sounds like a win, doesn't it? 
O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The scripture here doesn't say that death isn't real, that it's not painful, that it doesn't come for each of us, but it does say the power, the sting, the permanence of it is gone. Do you know why? Because all this world is not all that there is. And for those who are found in Christ, there is a hope that transcends politics. There is a hope that transcends every infirmity in our body, this side of heaven, every unfortunate thing that happens, every sin that's ever been committed against us or by us is fulfilled in the resurrection in Christ. That is what Easter is all about. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for this sacred place, this set-apart place where your people can just pause to consider questions that they haven't considered all year or maybe not once in their life. And it's that our world and everything in it is passing away but your word never passes away. Father, your word became flesh. Your word went to the cross for us. Your word fulfills in us the deep meaning that we all have because you created us eternal. And Father, I pray for anybody in here that's far from you. I pray for the conviction that comes from your Holy Spirit to draw them to the truth and that they would make a change. I pray, Father, that we would pause as people of the resurrection to remember and that Father gratitude and great joy would mark us all the days of our lives Lord we love you Amen I was lost I was lost I was lost I was lost I was afraid. I was broken. I was hopeless. 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 My relationships. My identity. My past. My past. My present. My future. My spirit was lost, afraid, and hopeless. But Jesus. But Jesus stepped into my life. Stepped into my life. Jesus stepped into my brokenness. Into my mess. My marriage. My baggage. Jesus stepped into my life. Into my life. And he spoke forgiveness into my past. Peace into my present. And hope into my future. Jesus spoke courage into my fear. He spoke healing into my brokenness. He brought life from death. I was once lost, but now I'm found. But now I'm found. I was once blind, and now I see. I see. I see. I don't have all the answers. And I don't know what tomorrow holds. But I know tomorrow is in his hands. Hope won. Peace won. Kindness. Justice. Grace. Forgiveness. Joy won. Love won. Life won. Jesus won. Jesus won. Jesus won. Jesus won. Jesus won. Jesus won. I don't know what you're doing. But I know what you've done. I'm fighting. I'm fighting. I'm fighting. But you've already won. You've already won. You've already won. You've already won. I want to do one more thing before we leave. Would you have a seat for just a moment? I want us to stay in an attitude of prayer. We're almost done. But something we've done since the beginning of our church in every service and every environment is we've provided a place and a space for people who are far from God to draw near to Him. Would you bow your head, close your eyes? Maybe you're in here and that's you. I don't have to look close into your life. I don't have to ask you an awkward question. You know if you're playing with God or not. You know if your faith is sincere. And in a moment, I'm going to pray for you. The Bible says that there's no amount of goodness that you have in you to get you right with God. But it's through an act of free will, putting your life under the cross and the resurrection that you're made right with God. And as heads are bowed, eyes are closed. In a moment, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to pray 
for you. And if you're in here and you'd say, Pastor, I'm far from God, I don't want to be, would you pray for me? Would you just acknowledge that by putting your hand up halfway? Is there anybody in here you say, Pastor, that's me, thank you, thank you, thank you. You put your hand up, put it right back down. You're just acknowledging, that's me. Is there anyone else you say, that's me, thank you, thank you, thank you. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's based on Romans chapter 10, verse 9. You might ask, why a prayer? It's because God respects you. He gave you free will. And he will not come into your life without you giving him permission. That's what this prayer is. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but I want to encourage you to say these words just loud enough where you can hear them. Allow them to be the expression of why you raised your hand. I believe on the other side of this act of free will, God's going to enter your life. We're also going to give you some steps. Your life will never be the same. As a matter of fact, our church believes in you so much, we're going to pray this prayer as well because it's where our faith started or restarted as well. Let's pray this prayer together. Let's pray, Jesus. Thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you are God, and I believe you're good. I believe on the third day, after you were killed on the cross, I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you defeated death once and for all to give me life once and for all. And so today, of my own free will, I choose to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's put our hands together.